Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can join the YouTube channel directly or give over at patreon.com slash oxum or sign up at oxum.substack.com or oxum.gumroad.com for select writings. Today's guest is John. Um, a lot of people have been going on this trend recently, and I saw actually a, a TikTok this morning where someone said their Roman Empire was, and they went in a totally different direction about how people ask them as Black American where their heritage from and stuff. Um, but I got to ask you, what do you think of the trend of people saying men think about the Roman Empire all the time? Yeah, uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I suppose I do think of the Roman Empire all the time but but uh as, as you say for me also as a as an historian of, of late antiquity it's perhaps a very different empire than uh than other people think of and it was funny with that trend because i noticed that you know when a lot of of men were asked to why they think of the roman empire um it their answers had to do with with like the decline of society and stuff mm -hmm. like that and as a historian of, of late antiquity and a student of, of peter brown my my the sort of my sort of scholarly training and and my notions about late antiquity are very are very different and i don't really see it as a period of decline um so yeah it's just it's just funny uh it's just very interesting but yeah yeah no so that's that's a good point and just uh for the the audience i jumped kind of right into it just because it was a trend and it, w it was interesting. I find myself thinking about it too, maybe less often than you, but uh, could you introduce yourself then uh, briefly? You, you mentioned that you are studying uh, late antiquity. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so I'm a current PhD student um, at Princeton and I study uh, in broad terms, the kind of religions of Mediterranean antiquity uh, with a focus on on late antiquity and uh, and and Christianity, although I also um, work quite a bit with, with Judaism as well. Um, and my training is sort of in classics um, and uh, in, in the Roman world. And uh, I, I actually started off doing more or less kind of standard traditional classical stuff, you know, reading Cicero and Tacitus and things like that. And um, as I started to get more into to Roman history, um, I, I I found myself pulled more and more towards uh, the, the later bits, which I found to be uh, even more fascinating than than the classical portion. Yeah, I, I actually I do want to ask you about that that latter portion, but first, um, there have been certain debates in academia recently, kind of about uh, rigor, and this might be a basic question for you, but I'm wondering how many of like i don't know classical languages do you have to learn and are they kind of periodized like latin and greek is what i'm assuming but is is are there other language requirements and or or can you just do it all in english mm -hmm. yeah good question so um i would say that in speaking of classics um in general uh latin and greek are kind of the bread and butter right um and then typically you would be asked to learn um several modern research languages just for the purposes of like doing scholarships. So French, German, Italian, maybe modern Greek, uh, depending on your, your area of focus. But um, as a, for, for people who work in late antiquity, um, that list tends to be actually much, much larger because we're, we're talking about a period uh, which sees the rise of various vernaculars. Um, and so for me and my colleagues, we're not only working in Latin and Greek, but you know, over the past several years, I've heard, had to learn a host of other uh, Jewish and Christian and uh, Muslim languages as well. So, but I like I like learning languages, so it's fun. That yeah, that that's really cool. Um, friend of the show, uh, Deacon Mahadi, has uh, done all the work with the Princeton project. Speaking of uh, Princeton, the miracles of Mary, and he he was the first person to tell me this. I didn't know this point that you were mentioning about having to study French and German. I guess it kind of makes sense because you're you're basically then reading the research of other scholars who've kind of come before you in the field. Like to do any sort of fair literature review, you wouldn't be bound to just the the English and then the the primary sources, but whoever's commenting on them in modern times uh, as well. And uh, actually, I used to have a, a coworker 
who her and her family's native language was the Judeo Spanish. Is that the type of stuff oh, wow. that you that you're talking about? Like these proto Italian and proto Spanishes, or what? What do you mean when you you just mean Hebrew and Arabic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those things those would be a bit later than than my period. Um, mm -hmm. For me, it's it's mostly early Christian languages. Um, you know, Syriac, Coptic, nice. Gez, um, Armenian, things like this, and then also um, I, I've done a bit I've done a bit of Hebrew um, because I'm I'm very interested in uh, rabbinic literature, and uh, and then also um, Arabic is is becoming becoming a lot bigger uh, for people who study this field. Uh, given the kind of shift towards seeing early Islam as very much a kind of uh, late antique phenomenon rather than, say, a, a medieval one. Yes. Yeah. I guess it depends on where you're defining these periods. And obviously, they're going to have some gray area of where they start and end. They don't always have the clean beginnings and endings. Um right. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Those languages you listed are all, they're like the languages of my Christian communion, <laughs> like Syriac, right, Coptic, right. Armenian, Giz. that's the Oriental Orthodox Church communion's languages. Right. So that's very cool to me um, to hear that they're becoming more studied and, and more broad. We find ancient manuscripts in places like the Sinai that has kind of all of them together. People have posted, I think it was um, one manuscript of the Psalms that I keep seeing people repost in, in different tweets. Yeah, or it's this beautiful, beautiful Psalter, which is now at the uh, the Met uh, exhibit at, on African Byzantium. Amazing. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, that, that must be why. It must have been in the news why people have been uh, sharing it again. I had seen it in the past as well. Um, I, I'm currently a, a middle school teacher and uh, I'm, I'm a sub and I was appalled the other day because I saw this uh, chart and I don't know if you've ever seen these history charts that say like which empire was kind of in charge at any given period. And in Africa, it has kind of like the rise of Aksum around this period and the quote unquote fall of it. And we'll come back to that in, in your studies. Um, and it kind of, made it look on this chart like Aksum was subsumed in Rome, whereas I always kind of viewed it as just a periphery, smaller empire. I'm wondering in your in your studies, how does Giz language and Ethiopia kind of appear on the radar? Like, how is it talked about? Yeah, <clears throat> so I would say that um, within my field, uh, right now, as we speak, we're we're witnessing something of a of a kind of paradigm shift in in the way uh, these things are, are sort of of talked about. So, I would say that that traditionally, um, even when you're speaking about like late antiquity as a as a field, um, Axum doesn't get much much attention. It's sort mm -hmm. of mentioned, right? Just kind of usually in the context of the spread of Christianity to you know the far corners of the world. Um, but in recent, in recent years, um, and, and I think as part of a, a more broader shift towards, uh, really taking seriously the kind of Christian cultures of, of the East, um, in late antiquity, you're seeing much more, um, of a, of an attempt to think about the interconnectedness of, of these worlds, um, the, the ways in which, uh, our, our kind of notions of center and periphery uh, are always always perspectival um, and are not do not really mean much in, in objective terms. Um, and yeah, this is this is corresponded with with a number of of things. I would say one of the most kind of prominent uh, that people might know about in the news is the redating of the Garima Gospels. Uh, which are this? Tell me, um, tell me about that because I've heard wildly different accounts, and I myself don't want to be inaccurate. But it seems like some scholars, I don't. It's almost as if they want it to be a more recent construct. And then on the other end, you know, of course, the the overly hubris Ethiopians want it to be as ancient as possible. Right, right. So the Gary Gospels, um, which I guess just say. Um, are yeah a set of gospel manuscripts uh in gaz and which um are not only translation of of the gospels but which also feature um some very beautiful elaborate um kind of artistic elements they have uh what are called canon tables 
which are basically this system for uh, reading the Gospels created by Eusebius in the early church and often um, in, in manuscripts across the Christian East and West. Uh, they're, they're kind of put at the beginning of gospel manuscripts and decorated in, in very elaborate ways. Um, it also has pictures, uh, portraits of the evangelists, uh, and also apparently uh, Eusebius himself. Um, and uh, so these are, so this is a, a set of manuscripts um, that were, have been known about for quite a while actually, um, but were originally dated to uh, a much later period than they thought to be now. So really, if you want to say 13th, 12th or 15th century. Um, so they've been known about for a while and actually some of their uh, artistic elements in particular were kind of, had been compared with other, um, with other kind of artistic trends from late antiquity. Uh, but it was only recently, uh, starting in the, the 90s, that um, a team actually decided to go back and actually um, carbon date uh, portions of, of the manuscript. And um, this, over really like a, a decade of doing this, um, it was established that the radiocarbon dates point to the fourth to seventh century. And you can't be really more precise with these things. Um, mm -hmm. But so, so obviously a much, much earlier uh, dating. And um, so not everyone accepts the radiocarbon uh, dating. These things are always controversial, but, but I would say uh, it seems to me, at least from my vantage, that uh, the majority of scholars I talk to uh, do take this seriously. And um, even radiocarbon dating aside, it's kind of spawned more of a conversation in talking about like, you know, what are the ways in which regardless of the date of this manuscript, we see features here that do teach us a lot about late antique cultures, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know if that, if that helps answer it your It does. Question. No, um, it, it's fascinating because I'm, you know, the name of this show is the philosophy of art and science. And the reason being is I kind of grew up a super STEM guy, you know, top percentile in math and all these things and kind of fizzed out in high school because I, I just didn't have a purpose. And when I didn't have a purpose, I didn't have any motivation. So in uh, college and grad school, I went all in on like humanities and social science and I kind of abandoned STEM. And a few years later, I ended up working in some universities out in the University of North Dakota and later the University of California Merced. And I was like, hey, I, I kind of like ignored this whole category of knowledge. It doesn't make sense. And so my favorite thing I'd say for the past six to eight years or so have been those projects that combine these things like historian and a geneticist, you know, compare historical written records with uh, DNA samples, because I think it cuts through a lot of the BS. And so you're talking about carbon dating. I don't particularly know how scientific and rigorous it is. Is the controversy that you're not just comparing it to you know, other local illuminated manuscripts? Or is it controversy that it, this is not a precise science? Like it's not like physics and chemistry and, or something? Yeah, I would say more of the latter. Um, it, it seems to me that the, the type of people who would, um, who would be more skeptical about, about, accepting, uh, about accepting the carbon dating of the Gary Gospels would, would just tend to be people who are skeptical of, of the precision of the science um, in general. Um, and so it's nothing, as far as I understand it, particular to, uh, to the Gary Gospels. Um, but again, I would say that that's, that's kind of a, in, in my experience, um, a minority. Uh, and there are also some people who, um, who are perhaps willing to accept the, the carbon dating, but are, but are still just like a bit more cautious about how far we go with it. Right. Like we don't want to stake everything on that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a there's a actually a beautiful volume that came out in 2016 um, from from Oxford um, on the Gary Gospels, which is like really the first uh, major volume dedicated uh, to it. And unfortunately, with all kind of Oxford Press volumes, it's very expensive. But um, <laughs> it's it's a wonderful yeah. volume. It, it not only has uh, material on the Gary Gospels themselves, but like. It has a lot of wonderful essays which try and utilize 
what these teach us to to kind of better contextualize and situate Aksum within this broader uh, kind of Mediterranean and Red Sea uh, kind of axis. Yeah, it's 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 very funny that you say that because both the Mediterranean and the Red Sea have been a ton in the news lately. The, yeah. Sadly, for the wrong reasons for for war and uh, strikes and bombs and and blockade of trade and and all these things. But it just shows us how knowledge and context of this part of the world has relevance. Sometimes I get history students, um, you know, middle school kids and high school kids who are like, "Why are we learning this stuff?" And it's like, oh. If you want to know about Israel and Palestine and the Houthis and where all this is and Syria and Iraq and Iran, you better know about the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So I am slacking. I need to get that book actually and probably review it for my channel. That is uh, looks like an excellent book. And I have a, a friend, he hasn't been on the program yet, but uh, a deacon who lived at the Grima Monastery actually for a few years. And so oh, wow. he he used to hold it. I'll, I'll share one small tradition that he he told me about that place, which was very funny. And later other friends said that the reason behind this is probably because the water is so poor. But coming uh, from, you know, a background uh, of Ethiopia, but living in the West, he hadn't known what to expect. He gets in and he's thirsty. He asks for water. And the monks asked him whether or not he was Pentecostal. And he's like, what are you talking about? And uh, <laughs> they said, here, we only drink moonshine beer. And so they call it Suwa and Tigrinya and in uh, Amharic, it's called Tala. Uh, but uh, they all they drank is this uh, type of homemade beer. And that, he said that's literally all they drank. And he was there for <laughs> years. But I, I'm assuming the alcohol content must be very low. But uh, we must thank God who somehow through these homemade beer drinking monks has preserved these Karima manuscripts that uh, my friend got to hold. Um, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And, and I've heard other histories of um, of monks making beer in Europe as well, so it's not so strange a thing. Um, you're you're also an LA kid, and you got to combine these interests. I was so glad when you reached out. I was sad I didn't get to see you there. It was a hectic weekend, as I'm sure you saw. But uh, recently, you got to celebrate Epiphany or Theophany in the Ethiopian tradition in Los Angeles for something like a decade. We were at the Great Western Forum where the Lakers used to play in Inglewood. And in the past few years, uh, when there was new ownership of the forum and they have all these new events there, we, some church member, got us a long-term deal at Dodger Stadium parking lots number 13 and 14. So I'm wondering uh, what you thought of that um, as an L.A. kid and someone interested in, in Giz culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And thanks, thanks again for, for uh, putting this on my radar. And inviting me, it did. It did really feel like uh, so many of my worlds kind of like coalescing into one. You know, uh, not least of which is like just being below Dodger Stadium, uh, you know, doing this thing. So, um, yeah, no, it, it was it was wonderful. Uh, it was wonderful. I um, it was it was actually my first experience of anything related to um, like Ethiopian Orthodox liturgy. Uh, for whatever reason, I just I hadn't been to any uh, kind of events or services yet. So. It was my first time and like I, I gotta say, um you guys just beat everyone else out and in, in, in terms of sheer like sort of liturgical splendor and that like the vestments and the music and um just just everything was like just magnificent. Um and uh, as as someone who grew up, you know, I grew up um Roman Catholic and, and as I'm sure you know, like um there's, you know, there's there's a whole lot of kind of discourse about uh, the liturgy in, in the Roman Catholic tradition yeah. and, and the changes brought about by the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. And like, I sort of come from a from a generation which um, just growing up, all we really knew was kind of like liturgy, which um, tried as hard as possible to kind of get away from from those uh, those traditions uh, within our church. And so. I think I mean I'm not I'm not at all the first one to say this, but like I think so many people um, who grew up like I did, we we've sort of just been like searching for uh, ways in which to reconnect with uh, this kind of larger historical Christian tradition, which also has a lot of uh, just aesthetic things that we find really beautiful that maybe our parents uh, didn't. So. 
Yeah, that's a very fascinating. I don't. I, I actually didn't know you were a Catholic, but uh, makes sense. And um, I, I, I have worked for Catholic schools in the past too. I always appreciate them, and it's very interesting. Um, I don't know everything about Vatican II. There's a lot more that I could learn about it, but from what I understand, there is this kind of, uh, and especially since Pope Francis de-emphasis interestingly on the kind of the ancient liturgy of the latin right but on the other end there are all these what used to be called uniate churches or the eastern churches including the churches of eritrea and ethiopia which are in the is right within the catholic church and those places they in the past like the earliest portuguese would have hold the orthodox and this is what bothered them so much on initial contact um very fascinating case studies just for people out there to study the jesuits work in japan which scorsese made the film silence about um but it's based off of a, a book as well and then seeing how they are in ethiopia seeing how they are in a non-christian country and then seeing how they are in a christian country and one of those things about those early contacts they were mixed reviews because I think the earliest context, they kind of recognize their Christianity and, uh, you know, Graham Hancock believes they helped to build La Libella uh, out of those monolithic structures, kind of uh, Jesuit or otherwise, uh, maybe even Templar Knight, <laughs> if Graham Hancock is right, uh, Templar Knight engineers with a project manager being Ethiopian, being the king. Um, but but later on, they wanted to say Ethiopians were not Christian. Uh, why do you honor the Sabbath? Why do you get circumcised? Why don't you eat pork? These kind of questions of Judaism, which goes with your other interests. And then they wanted to Latinize the country. And you, you see this efforts at Latinization or making it uh, the worship or the liturgy exactly as they had it at the time, which would have been in Latin. Um, and just all the other outward elements of that. Whereas it seems like since Vatican II, they've been allowing the local cultures to um, come out more. Sometimes controversially, I, I have a friend who runs the Black Catholic magazine, uh, Nate Tinner. He's been on the program before, and he he's highlighted some of the things like um, indigenous dances mixing with the liturgy. Some questions people have had right, right. about that, but but versus pre-existing cultures like the Maronites that had some sort of Syriac in the beginning and then become Catholic or the Chaldeans or the Ethiopians and the Eritreans or the Ukrainians or for that matter, or the or the Melkites who are the Greek speaking uh, from the Middle East. So there were like pre-existing Christian cultures, which they're allowing to do more. And I can speak on Ethiopia there. Um, particularly, I have heard of this bishop in the Gurage area who has made his church indistinguishable. My aunt actually just visited a few months ago and she was in Ethiopia. And she said she didn't know she was in a Catholic church until communion because the curtains were wow. closed. He was facing uh, the Orient rather than the Occident, the East rather than the West, away from the people, um, the icons, everything was Orthodox, she said. But then she saw some women as extraordinary ministers and she was like, hold on, where am I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was, yeah. that was a little, um, that was uh, a little different. Did, did you, sorry for that rant, did you ever notice though, Shia LaBeouf's recent conversion to the Catholic Church and anything that he has said. I, I know there's some personal things in his life that people have found to be abhorrent. Um, I, I don't know much about that, but I've heard people saying bad things about him for that, and I don't know much about that. But I found interesting, for example, his conversation with Bishop Robert Barron, who's very pro-Vatican too, um, but, and, and explains it and defends it well, I think, and even sells a book on it. But uh, Shia LaBeouf was captivated in my hometown of van nuys by the way no less yeah. of the latin liturgy being served in van nuys california yeah yeah i did i did um i did notice that and i did see that interview it's um again like the, the all of that happening like so close to where i grew up is is <laughs> uh, is yeah it's very very fascinating very interesting um yeah i i did notice that and i i um I liked I liked a lot of what he what he said um, in that interview, and um, it was uh, I, I think actually I haven't seen him personally there, but um, some of my friends have seen him at uh, Saint Vitus, that that parish in um, 
uh, in Van Nuys, in the Van Nuys area, the Latin Mass Parish, along with like several other, you know, kind of like celebrities. I mean, this is event like people that don't live in that aren't from LA. You know, I just like <laughs> they, they kind of just like think I'm I'm just like spinning a lo- a yarn. And when I talk about like seeing like uh, celebrities at Mass, uh, I think like. Tommy Wazoo was seen there or something. And like Ariel Pink went went to that church and wow. stuff. But, um, but yeah, I, I think like uh, another thing that, that I'll just say is that, um, yeah, I, I'm actually like a, a really big fan of Vatican II with, in this respect, um, with respect to the 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 relationship uh, to to the Eastern churches and the and Eastern liturgies. I think like you're, you're right that this is sort of a paradox, right? Um, and I think like, Vatican II uh, really did kind of for those churches um, and, and those liturgies really kind of spawn a kind of golden age and did move away, I think, rightly from this this notion of Latinization um, and assimilation uh, towards sort of allowing uh, people to to kind of embrace the the fullness of of, of their heritage. Um, and, and I'm all for that. I think you know my philosophy is like let a thousand liturgies bloom right uh, amen <laughs> we're talking about the universal church here right? yeah. Um, yeah pope john paul ii actually um was very involved in a lot of this too and um he had this doc this very important document um lumen orientalis uh which which is like just a beautiful document to read but um but yeah i i did i did see the shia labeouf thing uh and i and i did find it like very fascinating and also when he um when he was received into the church recently, it was at the Santa Barbara mission. Yes. Uh, which is like, of course, like, you know, a staple of my, my childhood and like my imagination and stuff. I, I was baptized at the San Fernando mission, but I always oh, you know, go to the Santa Barbara mission. Yeah. 818, my, my own home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Um, people who grew up in California, know, fourth grade, you have to study the missions. I, my parents made me go to the Santa Barbara mission because they wanted me to go somewhere not too close to home. But the San Fernando one was in our backyard. Like I could just gone to the San Fernando one and they're like, no, 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 no. you got to go somewhere else. So they sent me down El Camino Real to Santa Barbara. And I actually had a friend stay there and uh, learn and, and pray there for about a year. And he found many spiritual benefits from that location as well. So I'm, I'm glad you've been uh, keeping up with that stuff and the way you phrased it as this uh the paradox and i don't know if you're privy to i try to stay away from it honestly i i I like to say that i prefer to teach and to learn than to argue but the uh especially the very online greek orthodox converts trying to justify themselves uh the existence of the oriental orthodox communion to a purist bothers them because there are so many things that are so similar that it almost forces you to be a kind of ecumenist that they don't want to be. And so they look at the thousand liturgies blooming and they use it as an argument for us not being the true church. And then the Oriental Orthodox defenders of which I am, but much softer than a lot of other people who dedicate much more time to it, uh, say, actually, this is the very proof of universality, the way you said it. It would make sense that the universal church would have uh, different things. So, so I'm glad that the uh, the Catholic Church is also encouraging uh, different liturgies to bloom in this season as as well. Um, I'm I'm wondering. I, I'm, I'm it makes sense that you were saying you, you have such a breadth of uh, areas of Christendom and and outside uh, other religions and cultures and languages you're studying. It would be very difficult to have gone to you know all the various liturgies of all the different cultures. Um, but I'm glad you did get to experience the Ethiopian one. Was there anything that stuck out to you about the uh, celebration? I believe you were there on the the first day too, which is when, uh, for those who have never experienced it, you have multiple parishes all over Southern California. We have about 10. And from each parish, there is a, a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. And they they sort of do their own Eucharistic liturgy at their own parish. And then they all drive over to Dodger Stadium parking lot to to meet up. And uh, by the way, the elaborateness I always attribute to us having had the kind of long reigning kingdom, people always kind of reference Byzantium and some uh, crazy folks out there want to retake uh, Agia Sophia, <laughs> you know, from the Turks. Uh, but that, you know, ends in the 1400s, whereas the Ethiopian tradition is kind of 
continuing to evolve until at least the the 1970s because it it had its it had much less territory than the Roman Empire, but it it maintained its sovereignty into a longer period. So that's what I kind of always attribute, which kind of just gives it more time. And the other churches in our communion were always kind of getting swallowed up by other empires in their orbit. Right, right. Yeah, I would say that um, perhaps my favorite thing was just the, um, and, and you probably hear this a lot actually, is um, just the kind of Judaic quality uh, of, of it all. I mean, I loved uh, seeing the shofar uh, being blown. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and also, um, I, I really love the the ululations, yeah, uh, that the women make. I mean, which which like is, is just such um such an ancient feature of of religions. Uh, I mean, even you know just across the Mediterranean world and the Near Eastern world. So like um, to be able to like just hear people doing that uh, in in person. Um, you know, I'm used to like hearing about like reconstructions of like. Greek uh, pagan like ceremonies and antiquity and like the place of ululations and at like funerals and stuff and to actually oh, the Greeks you know, ululate as well? No, not anymore. Oh. But, but in in antiquity, in in yeah. um, pre Christian antiquity, ululations were a, were a big part of uh, of Greek religion. Um, I didn't know that in the mystery yeah. cults. That's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so just to just to hear all that, and then yes, obviously to see. The Tabot, and I loved that they were brought in in uh, Humvee limos. Uh, that, was, that was just like beautiful. Just like you know, you, you guys, yeah, you go all out, and and I and I love that. Um, and then yeah, just just processing into the big tent, um, and and the music. I could say yeah, I I, I could say a lot about like um, how fascinating I find uh, Ethiopian uh, music, sacred music. And chant and how dissimilar uh, melodically uh, it, it is, or it strikes me as to like so many of the other um, Christian musical traditions that I've heard, and, and I've just been like perplexed and fascinated by this, um, and, and sort of like thinking about how how to understand the development of this. Um, yeah, the the traditional Ethiopian story is that it's Saint Yared. A little more right. modern people will say the Juridian school. They'll say Saint Yared or Jared plus his disciples. Uh, the texts we've received about Saint Yared or Saint Jared himself say that he, he learned it from angels and the heavens and three little birds, which uh, Bob Marley sang about. Right. And uh, it's got a new biopic of Bob Marley coming out soon. So maybe Kutusiadid will get a shout out in that film. Probably not, but <laughs> but maybe. Um, but yeah, I had heard the early Gregorian chant was influenced by uh, the Syriac music. And I know there are some authors who've drawn some parallels between St. Ephraim the Syrian and St. Yadid. But I think with so much time, to elaborate, it, it it definitely you know they become they become their own entities even if they did have early influences. Yeah, um, I'd say even the um, the the instrumentation uh, and the mesmer, um, just like the I mean this is this is you're gonna find this weird and strange, but um, my, honestly, my first thought is like, oh my gosh, this sounds to me like southeast asian music it sounds like like traditional yeah. vietnamese uh folk music um in so many respects both uh in terms of the strings and the melodies in the strings and also the flutes um and also the drums uh and, and i have no idea like why um but uh you know i think it's not it's not it's not too far-fetched right we're talking about um we're talking about uh civilizations that you know are very much crossing the Indian Ocean, traversing these areas. And so like, I think, you know, whether or not there's any connection, like it's, it, it shouldn't surprise us if, if, if there would be someday, we find out that there would be. Um, yeah, they, it would be, it would be cool. And, you know, there's a little Saigon in Southern California too. So maybe you can get little Ethiopia and right. Saigon to link up and do their folk music um, together. I, I did think the Greek connection you said was stronger. It's, I had seen some of the, um, I forgot the proper term, but like the murals in the Minoan island uh, in the Bronze Age culture there of kind of pre-Greece, Greece. And they had our Sanats and the Sistra 
and what look yeah. like staves in their worship as well. And and that's funny because the latest DNA reports that the I have mentioned this a few times, the non-African uh, DNA side, because we're a mixed people, <clears throat> is uh, closest uh, of amongst the Habasha to the Minoans and the um, and the Tunisian Jews, uh, <laughs> which are two different groups. And I used to never think of them the same. And I know some people say there's a lot of continuity between the kind of Minoan and, and Mycenaean culture, but the fact that that first script was at linear A is still people still don't know. I, I do have this, I don't know if it's a pet theory or a pet desire <laughs> that it does end up being Semitic. And the fact that you said there was ululation even in the Greek culture was, um, that was surprising to me, but I had seen the use of the Sistra in Minoan culture and in ancient Egyptian culture as well, and probably the staves. And and the the kabaro or the, the kettle drum was uh, used by um, one of the Marys in the Song of Exodus, in Exodus 15 as well. So that's kind of the inspiration our church usually draws from. And it makes you wonder, did they kind of have it this whole time or did they get inspired by it within late antiquity and just like get those instruments because they were more accessible at that time? Right, exactly. This this is always, the, this is the kind of the major question that animates so much of, of my work is exactly that one. Um, and trying to piece together these, these things, um, which, which in, in many respects will probably always uh, be uncertain and, and fragmentary, but that, that's sort of what draws me to them. Um, I, I think that's why I think that's why I became an ancient historian is because I like puzzles more. Mm -hmm. I like I like having an absence of sources uh, because it, it, it gives my imagination uh, more more play. Um, I was joking with my my friends who do modern history about this because you know they're, they're spending all these time in the archives and they're just like I could never possibly get through all these sources. And I'm just sitting here. I'm like, dude, my dissertation is on three inscriptions. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. My my father has a ha, he loves Ethiopian history, but even he has a sort of a, a personal I don't know high skepticism of anything before the modern period, and so uh, he mostly just reads 1800s to the present and really it's like 1900s to the present he'll read 1800 stuff but like 1900s to the present is like that's like his 20th century i mean and it's his era so yeah. right. <laughs> uh, and his parent him and his parents era so he that's like his forte of what he likes to to read i'm i'm curious about how all this fits into your dissertation work and you mentioned it uh, earlier so I, I i'd like to hear you expand on it. i'm not familiar with Peter Brown, but it sounds like he's responding to the kind of, I want to say the major theory of Edward Gibbon and the history of the decline and, and fall of the Roman Empire from what little I know of him. And I know there's this famous passage from, from that text everyone likes to quote everywhere, that Ethiopia fell asleep for a thousand years. So maybe that would be a, a great segue. Is Peter Brown and your scholarship, is that in response to Edward Gibbon? And what what is like, do people still recommend reading his book? Like, where where is where does he stand in the field today? Yeah, really good question. Um, I would say, yeah. So I, I actually wrote a piece uh, recently for for a small uh, Catholic arts journal called The Lamp. Um, on it was a review of Peter Brown's uh, recent memoir. Um, it just came out, and the the title of the piece is "The Anti Gibbon," um, <laughs> and, and sort of like. Sort of, and, and the the kind of crux of it is um, of of my piece is sort of is sort of yeah framing the ways in which uh, Peter Brown his entire life's work is basically a response to Gibbon in so many ways. Um, he's often credited with like creating this entire field of, of late antiquity, which as a field uh, is is really a kind of reconceptualization of the period the very period that get, that Gibbon. Uh, wrote most about, um, but then also I think uh, the, the piece also tries to show the ways in which uh, Peter Brown and, and Gibbon are, are very similar um, in things like their use of the historical imagination, and also um, not least of which is their their prose style. They're both excellent writers, and I think uh, I think that's why one of the reasons why uh, people still read Gibbon today, why I read Gibbon. Um, I think. You could you could certainly say on the whole that that you know Gibbon gets a lot wrong, um, which is true. But he's also 
just just a beautiful writer um and you know he also uh there's also a lot of things that i think hold up um because he, he's writing a several volume work yeah uh, about this period and, and so uh, and he's he's um gibbon's histories are one of the first that uh have footnotes for example he's doing a lot of of um really rigorous uh research work so so yeah um but I, but i think but i think that's right i think in my own uh kind of experience um like peter brown has has been a sort of guiding light here um and he's He's a he's a scholar who has he started off kind of working more in the Latin West, and um, as his career went on, he started going further east. And now, uh, his main interest is actually is actually Ethiopia. Um, oh, he's, no way! If you look at the the New York Review of Books, uh, his last several pieces in there are all in Ethiopia. Um, so, and, I, and I'd highly I'd highly recommend uh, anyone checking those out because once again, he's just a, he's an amazing writer. Um, and, uh, he actually, during COVID, uh, he taught himself Ge'ez and, uh, he, he read through, I mean, he's like an amazing polymath. And so he read through the entire Cabernagast during, during COVID. Amazing. Um, but yeah, um, so I could, I mean, I guess I, I suppose I could say something about how I personally came to, uh, Axum within, mm -hmm. within the broader field, if that would be of interest. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so I started off and for a long time was was working mostly in Greek and Latin sources. Um, and when I got to Princeton, I, I thought that my research was going to be mostly in the Greek East um, and mostly in kind of intellectual history and uh, the Cappadocian fathers and things like this. But uh, during my first year, uh, COVID happened and I was supposed to uh, travel abroad to to do some research stuff and I couldn't do it, and then it just so happened that um, a Gaez course was being offered uh, at, at Princeton, and so uh, I decided to take it uh, just for fun, mm -hmm. and uh, and and I and I fell in love with the language, um, and around the same time as this was happening, I was taking uh, I was doing seminars with uh, the scholar Martha Himmelfarb, who's uh, was like a really big uh, deal in Second Temple Judaism uh, studies. She just retired um, two years ago. And I was taking these seminars in Second Temple Judaism with her, and I was reading a lot of uh, Enochic literature and a lot of texts that um, were texts from the Second Temple period, Jewish texts, but which um, were had only survived uh, in, in Ethiopic, classical Ethiopic, as and uh, i remember just reading a bunch of these texts and reading the scholarship on them uh and 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 wondering well why is everyone uh you know studying the ethiopic words and giving these philological analyses and commentaries but they're not at all talking about like why do these why do these hebrew texts make it into yes, like what yeah. like why you know and so i found that um i found that among scholars of second temple judaism uh there was kind of this instrumentalist interest in like learning as to be able to uh, comment on these these Enochic texts, mm -hmm. but like not actually really uh, focusing much on like why how they came to be this way. So I got really interested in this question, and I'm like I'm gonna find out why these late antique Ethiopian Christians decided to translate uh, to translate these texts into Gez and lo and behold as i started to look into this i found that like really not many people had studied this at all um and so uh that's sort of how i got into uh in a broad sense looking at axum um and uh and then yeah i don't know like i could i could talk more specifically too about please uh, yeah i think you told me there were some kingly inscriptions that you were looking at yeah so my my dissertation um my dissertation now is actually, uh, for various reasons, not on the Enochic uh, texts, uh, but I'm still interested in them. We could we could still talk about them because um, I, I think they're very much going to be part of a, of a future project. Yeah, um, I was named after them. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a you know it's a perfect name. Um, but um, for the purposes of my dissertation, I'm looking at the use of biblical quotations 
in the inscriptions of two Aksumite kings, um, Caleb, who people know pretty well, uh, he's, he's a saint in not only the Ethiopian church, but also in the actually in the, in the Roman Catholic church, yeah. Yeah, which is which is really cool. Um, and then also his son, who's lesser known, uh, was Zeb, who, who also, um, who also has uh, inscriptions with quotations. And um, what we're basically talking about here is um, this tradition whereby Aksumite kings, um, upon the conclusion of successful military campaigns, um, they erect uh, these big throne, uh, like stone throne monuments, uh, which often have inscriptions in the side of them, which you know talk about the course of the military campaign, the peoples that were conquered, uh, the territories that were taken, et cetera. And this is the tradition that uh, begins in the pre-Christian period. Um, and so in earlier ones, for example, you know these these things are dedicated to the war god, Marem, sometimes um, sometimes equated with the Greek uh, Ares. Mm -hmm. um, actually, because there was a lot of Hellenistic influence. Um, but with the inscriptions of Caleb and Ozeb, what we see for the first time is a, a, a kind of um, a desire to not only like relate the course of the campaigns and talk about the virtues of the king um, and his personal glories in battle, or even uh, kind of thanking in a, in a kind of patronal or transactional sense, uh, the patron deity for granting him victory, um, which we which we also see in earlier Christian inscriptions. But for the first time, we seem to see like a real attempt to uh, to interpret the significance of these activities through scripture, through scriptural narrative, uh, in a ways in a way in which uh, th these kings are kind of like reading scripture typologically to interpret what they're doing on the battlefield. Uh, and not only that, but they're doing it from like a first person perspective, almost in a kind of like Lexia Divina sense. So uh, they're reading the Psalms, for example, and they're looking at like very specifically particular verses of the Psalms and being like, okay, yeah, when, when King David talks about this happening on the battlefield, that's also me, right? <laughs> and and that's, that's, uh, that's what God did for me. And things were about to go really poorly at this, moment in battle and then god stepped in and did this in the same way that he did it for for david um so i just was like super fascinated in this i, I was like why why are these um why are these Aksumite kings so interested in not only portraying themselves as military victors and as great conquerors but also as masters of scripture scriptural exegetes like what what is it about the notion of authority and legitimacy here where these things two things go together um and so i, I was very I'm, I'm very fascinated by that question because um and, I, and i'm still in the in the in the thick of, of research but it seems to me to represent uh this kind of model of the relationship between uh the monarch the sovereign and um and the church and theology and uh scriptural exegesis which um, you don't seem to find earlier than this. Um, you know, like Constantine and even the later Roman Empire emperors are not necessarily claiming to be like master of scriptural exegetes, mm -hmm. right? That's how churchmen uh, negotiate their own authority over communities, but not that's not necessarily how Roman emperors do it until you get to the sixth century. And what I'm finding is that the sixth century seems to represent this moment in which not only in Ethiopia, but across uh, the, the Mediterranean world as well, um, political authority comes to be bound up in a much closer way with spiritual authority and with exegetical authority. So for example, at roughly the same time as this is going on, um, Justinian is, is doing something similar. Uh, he's 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 presenting himself as a master of scripture, and he's interpreting scripture in his public proclamations. Um, and there's a whole other side that I'm finding too, in terms of specifically these military contexts, where um, Byzantine emperors, 
and emperors and kings of these other uh, Christian kingdoms, for example, the, the Frankish kingdom, they're utilizing the Psalms as these as their own kind of personal oracles. Um, and scholars of late antiquity have, have talked a lot about um, the kind of birth of a, of a new sort of subjectivity, um, whereby not only are communities themselves uh, and, and communal identities understood to be centered around texts in a way that they hadn't been before. So like what it means to be a community is centered around shared exegesis and hermeneutical assumptions about texts, but also like the very notion of the self uh, comes to be more bound up in, uh, in, in the notion of my relationship to a text, right? And so things like what we in the West call Lexio Divina, the idea that like you just, you know, in a, in a cynical vein, you could also, you can almost call this bibliomancy, right? Of just like flipping through the scripture, landing on a passage and saying, how does this, this relates to me personally. I mean, this is what Augustine does uh, in the confessions with the tole, tole yeah. lege, take up and read, right? This is this cultural moment where this type of thing starts to, to be becoming, which we, which we very much take for granted today, uh, begins to come into its own. And so I'm really interested in situating and uh, in, in understanding this broader phenomenon by utilizing uh, these Aksumite throne inscriptions as a kind of case study. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I think it's jarring in our post-revolutionary world, meaning beginning in the American Revolution and then the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, in our context, the Ethiopian Revolution, because you get this idea that church and state are supposed to be so separate, but in the ancient world, that is not the case. But what's interesting about how you talk about this unique aspect, although it appeared, you said in Justinian and others, is maybe what's going on in the mind of Constantine is what I have seen in just casual glances, I'll say, or dabbling in looking at the Indo-Europeans or the Aryans as they always had this tripartite system of, of like i grew up playing rpg games and reading fantasy novels well there's like different character classes and so you have like the warrior class is a separate class than the priestly class and what's what's fascinating to me about the indo-european world is that it seems the romans the greeks and others um the scandinavians the the Ger germanic tribesmen they all kind of had the warrior class on top but in the Indian subcontinent or South Asia, you see it's the Brahmins, it's the priests that are on top. But then in Ethiopia, especially even later on, not just uh, Caleb, you get the extreme version of this in um, the the kings after the so-called fall of Aksum from about 900 AD to to the till the famous 1270 date. The kings like Lalibela, Nakuto, Laab, they're called priest kings, which then feeds into the the European idea of Prester John, of that Ethiopian right. priest king. He's he's not just like an exegete; like <laughs> he's a priest too. He's liturgical. Um, but it's interesting that that the prototype of that existed in in Caleb as, as well. Um, is 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 that what you think is is going on? Is that they saw like being a warrior? Or a jock and being a or being a priest and a nerd are like totally different things. But then you see Caleb is like, I don't know, the warrior monk uh, aesthetic. Because because later Ethiopian kings, uh, very explicitly, um, I think of the Ethiopian king known as Constantine himself, but whose name was Zerayakob. Not to be confused with the philosopher, which Princeton has also released a, a book on recently. Um, but Emperor Zerayakob grew up in the church. Uh, Emperor Theodros was seen by a lot of people as a sort of Ethiopian Kemalist, uh, you know, like before <laughs> Kemalism rises in Turkey, because he's he's seen as anti-clerical. He reduces uh, church property. He takes away, um, he, he reduces the amount of priests that are supposed to be in the service because he thought there are too many of them and he, he wanted more soldiers. But even someone like that, he grew up in a monastery until he was like 12 or 13. And so all these people kind of grew up in, in the church. The closest American analogy I can think of is like almost every famous like black R&B singer grew up uh, singing in the gospel choir in the black church in America. Right. Like there's this base or foundation that was in the church. So it's, 
it's almost like they can't help themselves. And I know the early American founders, like Thomas Jefferson and them, they might have used some of this rhetoric, but you know, he famously had the Thomas Jefferson Bible divorced of all the miracles. Right. Lincoln, uh, I think, used a lot of KGV language in his speeches. Um, but I remember I actually appreciated one of the things he said about the Civil War was that each side thinks God is on his side. So it, it, he's right. kind of self-reflecting on that idea that you're saying of reading yourself into the scriptural text. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and this is why I think as I go on in my project, I'd be, I'd be very interested um, to, to learn more about, about these later periods um, in Ethiopian history. Um, and, and if you have any recommendations, they would be greatly appreciated because I think that, yes, like what, what we're seeing here is, is maybe the genesis of, of these later ideas that continue on, but, um, but that perhaps looking to this, these later periods um, can help us to some degree to understand, uh, to understand the, er the earlier ones. Um, I guess one, one thing that I should, should maybe say um, that, that might be, I might clarify uh, things a bit here is that um, when we when we talk about uh, the Aksumite Kingdom, uh, one of the reasons in which I think it hasn't received uh, the, the study it deserves is that we're talking about an evidence base uh, that people uh, haven't really known what to what to do with, right? So, um, unfortunately, we're we're talking about um, we're talking about something for which very many of the ancient manuscripts uh we don't have they, mm -hmm. they don't survive i mean the garima gospels would be um would be one of the only examples of this and there are various reasons that people have speculated as to why uh these manuscripts don't survive that would help us i mean we we know they existed um but we're talking about like why am i looking at inscriptions right well that's pretty much what we have right uh, we have inscriptions we have uh, a few archaeological excavations, um, but I'm basically trying to like use these inscriptions and squeeze those three inscriptions, and I'm trying to squeeze all that I can uh, out of them in ways that other people have just sort of neglected neglected to do. Um, and so I think like one of the reasons why this is relevant is because the very uh, absence of of evidence, which is not evidence of absence, right? As, as we all know, um, <laughs> has kind of ha, has kind of been utilized uh, in this latter fallacious way in scholarship, right? So, for example, um, everyone knows that uh, in a broad in a broad sense, right? Ethiopia becomes Christian when King Ezana uh, converts to, to Christianity around three thirty. So like more or less two decades uh, after Constantine. Uh, we know that, you know, Christianity, at, at the very least, we know that Christianity exists in Ethiopia then, even though it probably existed earlier. And if, if you read uh, the story of Frumentius, uh, we see that there were already, there were already Christians in, in Ethiopia. Um, but what, what you do with that kind of depends a lot upon your own methodological priors, right? So you could say that the king himself and maybe his court were Christianized, but what does that mean about the rest of the country, mm -hmm. right? Um, and similarly, you could then go up to the sixth century and say that, okay, it's one thing to say that Caleb uh, and Wazeb were putting up these Christian uh, inscriptions, but what does that say about the rest of the country? And so what I found is that a lot of scholars have a very kind of uh, skeptical and reductionist view of how far Christianized we should see uh, the Ethiopian population writ large at this time, right? And so there's this notion that uh, large swaths of the population of the countryside, for example, could still be pagan in this period. But what I'm sort of trying to say is that when you look at inscriptions, these inscriptions, uh, inscriptions are not just put up for uh, for anybody, right? They're not just put up for the the vainglory of of the king. Like inscriptions have audiences, and this is something that we're that more and more scholarship is coming out about on in, in terms of late in, late antique inscriptions in general, right? Because the older attitude was that 
inscriptions are basically meant for elites, right? People who can who can read them uh, mm -hmm. and write them. But um, more recent scholarship has has just shown that um, this is a very reductivistic way of looking at what literacy means in the ancient world, right? Um, we're talking about a world in which, yes, in a in a kind of uh, full sense, many many people are illiterate, but in which societies themselves can still be very literate uh, and engage in literate practices in the sense that we're talking about uh, a relationship between text and orality uh, that is not oppositional, right? So for example, we know that a lot of inscriptions were read to people and yeah. were incorporated as part of uh, these larger liturgical or paraliturgical ceremonies. And so this is something that I think might be going on with these throne inscriptions, that they might be being used as part of these royal ceremonies, um, whether or not we're talking about like the king actually sitting on the the throne, I don't I don't know. Um, but in any case, like I think we need to take more seriously the idea that these inscriptions uh, could say a lot about the Ethiopian population at large in this time. And if that's the case, then when we look at these the Kaleb inscriptions and the Wazed inscriptions, we're talking about a, popul a populace that already in this time very much uh, is immersed in scripture and views itself uh, in terms of identification with Israel, with Davidic kingship, with things like this. Um, and so I really wanna, I'm really interested in thinking about like how that changes our picture, right? of uh, of the origins of a lot of these ideas, right, within Eth Ethiopian history. So the Kebra Nagast, right, uh, where you get the most kind of fleshed out version of the story of Solomonic uh, descent. Um, once again, scholars have taken sometimes a very uh, reductivistic view of this or skeptical view of this and said that, well, like this is really a 14th century, 13th century text, and we can't really trust what it says about these ancient traditions. Um, how does looking at these inscriptions and how they're interpreting the Bible potentially change that, right? Um, this is something that I'm very much interested in. And one of the things I've been looking at recently is I've been actually getting in the weeds quite a bit on Islamic origin scholarship and mm -hmm. particularly what scholars have been saying about the original audience of the Quran, right? Um, so in broad terms, right, uh, the, the traditional Islamic story is that the Quran is preached in an environment that is largely pagan, right? This is the, the Jahiliya, the age of ignorance. Um, but the Quran itself is full of biblical reference, biblical allusion, even biblical quotation at some point, and seems to presume an audience that actually knows quite a lot about the Bible, right? Um, and so scholars have used this to kind of like theorize what these the audience or various audiences of uh, the original Quran might have known about the Bible. And so I'm like looking for models that I can use here. You see what I mean? Um, but this is like one of the larger implications of my project is about like reassessing the process of Christianization of Ethiopia. I, it's it's so beautiful, and I'm I'm looking forward to getting my hands on on your research when whenever you're publishing it more. When you speak about the orality of the text, I'm reminded of my Hebrew teacher and my grandmother, my uh, my Hebrew teacher, the wonderful Palestinian and Greek Orthodox priest, Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, he taught me during the pandemic too. So. Uh, Peter yeah. Brown picked up goods. I picked up uh, Hebrew, just basic level during the pandemic. So you had time on your hand, and I try to improve my goods a little bit too. But uh, he always points to, for example, um, the Tehillim or Psalms, chapter one, and that last law, uh, that last line, which is often translated, and in his law, he meditates day and night. He's always frustrated by translations like that. So he he takes the Wabatorato Yahagu. Uh, uh, was it Yamam wa Laila? He says the the Yaga, which is this translated as meditate. He's like it's really like an utterance, and 
he says it's like the ba that a sheep makes because there's no difference between this this the human utterance and the animal utterance and so you would never say that a sheep is meditating unless you're really personifying and and so he says rather than kind of uh, personify the sheep you should sheepify the human and then you get to understand the what what it's getting at and he says what the core of what he's getting at is this orality of the text that you're saying is it's not like uh you know Eastern religions of uh, Buddhism, Taoism, or Hinduism would teach about meditation, which you know spread by Osho to Oregon and the rest of the United States right. to the point where we have the famous Sam Harris meditation apps in the U.S. now. Um, but rather, it is just recitation or reading aloud of the text. Because even if there were high illiteracy rates, there were a lot of people just sitting around and reading. Uh, bringing it back to my grandmother and Giz, um, she passed away at the end of 2019, but uh, when I was with her in 2019 or 18, and then even when I first started to read Giz and Amharic, uh, before I knew any Giz in 2011, this last time I visited her in Ethiopia, she would take out her, which I've now inherited, heirloom, which is like a 700 year old Psalter. And then she'd have a modern Psalter in Amharic, and she would read it to me in Giz and then explain it to me in Amharic. So I knew at least she had a Giz Psalter. Um, but towards the end of her life, she wasn't just quoting the Psalms to me in Giz. She started quoting to me from the book. And this is, by this time, my Giz has improved, so I know what she's saying. She started quoting to me, um, what did she say? Uh, uh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. She started mm -hmm. quoting to me the first chapter of Job in Giz. And what came to my head was like, I know she doesn't have the book of Job and Giz, although it is one of those ancient texts in the classical Ethiopic corpus. I don't think she has that lying around. I've never seen it. I never heard of any family members talking about it. In my head, I said, she must have been hanging around and she had family members that were priests and, and church uh, clergy of different stripes. She must have heard people saying this verse in Giz. It must have been one of the idioms that she grew up hearing. You know, she was 90 years old or so in uh, in uh, 2019. So uh, do the backward math there of like the early 20th century, there must have been people walking around speaking aloud the text of Job, which kind of, uh, to your point and your argument, gives people access to literacy in a different way, where it's not even just an oral tradition, but an oral tradition of the written text, which is kind of would be a different thing than just a pure oral tradition and different thing than the person reading it themselves. I'm sure there's some telephone game going on sometimes, but I was I was really impressed with my own grandmother, if you'll allow me to, to be quoting to me as Job. Yeah, no, that that's amazing. Um and I, I think like it really illustrates um one of the one of the major problems um in in in, in the way scholarship works sometimes is that um there's oftentimes a, a, a large kind of disconnect or chasm between uh, scholars and and the the traditions and the histories of the the communities they they study, right? And so, I would say that a lot of scholars that are you know, and, and this is not just even you know in Ethiopian studies, but but across uh, across disciplines, you know, a lot of a lot of scholars making claims about literacy and illiteracy. Are people that have never really spent time in traditional societies, right? So, like a famous example here is with the Homeric poems, um, right? And so, like th there used to be this idea um, that like the Homeric poems just like must must have been uh, composites of multiple authors, multiple uh, you know multiple patchworks and things like that uh, until early in the twentieth century. Um, Actually, a Californian, Milman Perry, um, started to uh, travel amongst uh, bards in Eastern Europe, uh, who would who would who would sort of like deliver oral poetry uh, in in villages and stuff, and who were completely illiterate uh, in terms of reading, but who were who were bards who would deliver poetry, and noticing that um, just the the memories of these people. Were just amazing, and and the amount of not only the amount of like things they could remember in a general sense, but like the amount of like literal word for word pieces of poetry they could remember. And so one of his major contributions was actually looking at 
the places where if you've ever read the, the Homeric poems, you'll notice there's actually a lot of repetition, mm -hmm. um, a lot of repetition in, uh, in, in names and in phrases and epithets. Uh, and even in like some cases in whole kind of like narrative sections. Right. And people had before seen this as evidence of just kind of like a kind of clumsy stitching together of various parts of text. But what he noticed is that among these bards repetition, uh, was actually kind of used as an aid to memory, right? And yeah. so allowing uh, allowing for repetition, right, and repeating these things would sort of allow the bard to like get ready to tell his next story. Um, and so he could sort of go on autopilot as it were for a minute and then tell his next story. And he could elaborate, elaborate it creatively in various ways that were unique to him. Uh, but this would sort of give him time to do that. Um, it sort of reminds me of the, uh, the, do you say it, Kene or Kene, the mm -hmm. yeah, liturgical Kene. poetry? Yeah. 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 I, had, I found uh, so fascinating. I have a friend who just got certified recently as a professor and he's like 21 years old. It's amazing. He did it all on Zoom. It's crazy. He was a guest on my show yeah. before. Very, very amazing guy. And he didn't know Amharic in advance. He knew Tigarinya. So he, he had to learn Amharic to learn Gu'uz because the teaching of the Gu'uz is, is preserved in the Amharic. So right. <laughs> incredible memory as you can imagine. And uh, yeah. people in Ethiopia are known for memorizing huge swaths of the Psalms. Some people uh, memorizing the entire Psalter. My my Hebrew teacher, again, actually sent me a video a while back because he was impressed with uh, an Ethiopian boy from a single mother uh, a home who his mother had pushed him. She was He was Muslim. And uh, he, he did the best uh, Quranic recitation in these contests they had. I don't know if it was in Saudi or UAE, but they had uh, some... Gulf Arab contest of who could recite the Quran and an Ethiopian boy won it from a single parent home. Wow. Um, but yeah, I'm always impressed with these these feats. And um, I don't know if you ever watched the series The Witcher, but I really liked the bard uh, yeah. in there. And I grew up, uh, like I said, with RPGs and fantasy books that all bard is the classic ar archetype. And uh, I'd like to think I can't sing, but I like to think of myself as a, a bard of of sorts. It's um. It's interesting you mentioned this. I don't know, because I, I like to reference the timeless and the timely. This is less timely, but interesting. Uh, Boris Johnson famously was reciting uh, from heart in the Greek parts of the Iliad. Had you ever come across that? And uh, how did you rate his Greek? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I, I saw that in uh, in one con. I think he's done it on a few different occasions. Uh -huh. uh, but no, it was good. I mean, he, you know, it's one of those things where he probably, you know, he learned it when he was a, when he was a young kid and uh, it's kind of like attained this, it's reached this part of his memory where it's just kind of like, it's there. Right. Um, it, it won't go away. And so, I mean, it remi it, it's sort of like, you know, my, my grandfather um, uh, was, he's a, he was Italian. He was an altar boy when he was, uh, when he was a child. And uh, he, this was before Vatican II. So the prayers were all in Latin. Mm -hmm. He didn't understand any of them. But uh, on his deathbed, when he had uh, forgotten everything, who we all were, uh, he could he could recite the Latin, uh, and so like memory is just like memory is just a crazy thing. Um, Amazing. Uh, yeah. A former assignment I had in medieval studies for seventh graders that they really liked was, I had them uh, memorize the um, the gunpowder treason plot poem, and I remember towards the uh -huh. end of the year, one of them who was annoyed with me at the time for getting that like we spent a whole class period one time just trying to memorize that was the assignment at the end he just randomly and i had forgotten the poem myself but their memory was incredible. like i knew the poem but i hadn't yeah. memorized it as well as them even he came up to me randomly and recited it uh verse for verse and that's the one that v for vendetta is based off of uh i was i was very uh, impressed with him so this kind of original uh, rhyme scheme and, and repetition uh, there's no substitute, I think, for studying the original languages, and I encourage as many people to do that as much as possible. But it's just not realistic. Not everybody has that self-motivation, um, as you said, Peter Brown did, and as you do, and as I have a smidgen of myself. Uh, so do you have, I know this is a topic of different opinions as well, do you have, for example, just picking the Iliad and the Odyssey, do you have any recommended translations in English for people to go? And like, these are books assigned in high school and stuff, and sometimes in college if you do great books, but if someone wanted to um, attack those things now, what what would you say to them? Like, is there 
commonly acknowledged good English translation, or do they keep doing it each generation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, with the Iliad and the Odyssey, I think yeah, there, there's there's so many of them. Um, it is a kind of like it is a kind of tradition, right, amongst scholars. Like when they reach a certain part of their career to like translate the, the Iliad and the Odyssey and do their own thing. And of course, there's like prose translations, there's verse translations, um, and yeah, different people have different opinions. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually, you know, some people would, would, uh, would get mad at me for this, but I'm actually a big, uh, fan of the Robert Fagel's translations, uh, which are, which are probably like the most common ones you would find right now, um, on the market. I, I'm actually a, a, a big fan of, of the way in which he, he does them. Um, but I would say Richard Lattimore is also, is also pretty good. Um, I think like, Honestly, the, the the most important thing, or the more important thing, is I would say that if you're going to read them, uh, look up, go on YouTube or something, and listen just in the Greek mm -hmm. uh, to to uh, somebody reciting them uh, as music, as music, because they don't they don't rhyme, but they have rhythm, and um, they were meant to be accompanied by by instruments, and like when you start hearing the rhythm. Uh, and, and, and the beat, as it were, you, you start to realize like, oh, actually, this is a song. And, yeah. you know, also songs are, are much easier to memorize than, uh, than, than, than prose. It's why we it's why we can like have never, you know, we haven't heard a song in 20 years and we forget the name of it. But we like it comes on. We know the lyrics. Right. Um, and so I would I would encourage people to, to do that um, because. It, you can, and this is like also one of the things that I really liked about uh, being at Epiphany was just like people uh, sit like standing around and like singing and like singing to the beat of the drum. Like I think this is just such a important part of of traditional cultures um, that 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 we've lost uh, in, in the modern West that we can't really uh, we can't really fathom we can't really comprehend. Um, you know, I think Plato was right when he said uh, somewhere that, you know, the, the invention of writing kind of like ruined uh, civilization because it ruined memory, <laughs> right? We no longer had to rely on memory, so we got lazy. Yeah, let alone writing. My smartphone erases uh, all the memorized uh, phone numbers I had and addresses I had when I was a kid just in the 90s oh, and, and in the SFV in the San Fernando Valley. I appreciate all your work and that it, it has so many Venn diagrams with me and my city and my interests as well. And I'm so glad that we were able to link up on X. I have found a two-year anti-Gibbon piece in The Lamp and the New York Review. Is there anything else where uh, that you'd like to plug or any any other places that you want people to kind of uh, find your work online? I know I'll definitely be looking forward to it as it comes out. Yeah, I would say um, just just be looking out for it in the future. Um, I'm I'm been giving some some talks on uh, various chapters of my dissertation, and I'll be presenting one at the Oxford Patristics Conference um, in August and. I hope to get that uh, that published as an article, probably in the the journal Studies in Late Antiquity. So uh, just just be on the lookout for that. And um, yeah, and uh, if if anyone has any like uh, research tips or like leads they want to give me, uh, I'd be very grateful. So thank you very much for being on the program, John. Thank you. Thank you.